the nonprofit MBA purpose is to provide new business insights and fresh creative ideas for executive directors and their teams that will help them improve their organization. Here is your host, Stephen Holastic. Welcome, everyone. My name is Stephen Holastic. I will be your host today for the um, for the entre- I'm sorry for the nonprofit uh, MBA podcast. Um, I am co-founder of Financing Solutions, and we are the leading provider of lines of credit for nonprofits in the United States. If you're interested in potentially looking into getting a line of credit for nonprofit, I would highly recommend that. I can't tell how many clients I have that just love it. Um, and I'm not saying that from a sales point of view, I'm just telling you the truth. Um, please visit our, our website at uh, nonprofitmbapodcast.com. Again, nonprofitmbapodcast.com. And also, I want to wish everybody a happy new year. The airing of this or the recording of this is uh, January 5th of 2023. I want to wish everybody a happy new year. I, I always love New Year's because if I had a crappy year, I get a fresh start. And if I had a good year, I get a uh, I get to do it again. So I always like New Year's. It's always a good time for me to reflect and to plan. Um and uh, this year in 2023, we uh, we actually have a sponsor, and I want to uh, welcome Arrays Fast Fund Online. Uh, Arrays is a cloud-based system that seamlessly integrates nonprofit fund accounting, fundraising, and payroll in a single solution. I am a firm believer in getting software that's specifically built for an industry. Uh, and you know, if you're using QuickBooks right now, it's just, you're trying to make it work for the nonprofit sector and certainly QuickBooks is well known, but they, they just don't even come close to doing, uh, what a raise does, which has specifically, uh, been built for small nonprofits. And, uh, I know the owner well, he's been on my podcast before he's actually on every month and he's a, a great guy. So if you're interested, go to a raise, it's A R A. I Z E dot com or call Joe at eight four seven two six one nine six zero five. And today I am very excited to be speaking with Raya Wong from Raya Wong Consulting. And today's topic is going to be uh, money mindset and fundraising for nonprofits to thrive. Raya lives in Brooklyn with her husband. When she is not raising money for causes she loves, she can be found hosting her podcast, Nonprofit Lowdown, promoting her newest book, Get That Money, Honey, or on stage as a newbie stand-up comedian in downtown Brooklyn. Rhea, welcome to today's Nonprofit MBA podcast. Steven, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to let you in on a secret. You, You ready? Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> I love Brooklyn. I love Brooklyn. I, I love Brooklyn too. I know. I want to move to Brooklyn. Yeah. Where are you now? I, I've, I'm only. Uh, I'm only. I'm 50 minutes outside New York, and uh, but I have a very good friend who lives in Brooklyn, and I actually, you know, I look. And I have a five year plan. In five years, I'm going to move to Brooklyn, uh, to Brooklyn Heights, uh, and that's where I kind of want to move to. And for those of you who have never been to Brooklyn. It is the coolest area. It is so there. The restaurants are amazing. Uh, the artist, the artistry that uh, you know, the, all the different. Things. It's so hip. That's the best way to put it. I don't know. Maybe am I? It's, if I say I'm so old that if I say hip, is that not cool anymore? Ah, uh, you know, I, I'm hardly the arbiter of cool, but I will admit that Brooklyn is very, very cool. And I, I actually, yeah. I'm originally from. Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And so when I moved to New York in 2005, I was actually living in Manhattan. And my boyfriend, then now my husband, uh, suggested that we move to Brooklyn. And my first reaction was, I did not move from San Francisco to live in Brooklyn. And now I'm like, <laughs> like, you can't, can't get me out of Brooklyn. Well, Brooklyn is what New York used to be, right? Mm. It used New York City, Manhattan, we're talking about Manhattan, you know, there's five boroughs, and Manhattan used to be cool. You know, it used to be hip. It's, I mean, it still is, but it's not, you know, there's, it's, it's gentrified in very many areas now. Yeah. And, you know, and so all the cool people have moved to 
Brooklyn and it's, it's Brooklyn's yeah. huge. It's huge. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it is huge. And you know, what's interesting about Brooklyn is the way in which it's become this global brand. So I was recently in France and I was talking to, you know, some younger folks and they were like, Oh, you live in Brooklyn, Brooklyn. <laughs> So it has become, which I actually think there's some interesting lessons that nonprofits can take away around branding and marketing. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, look at the, you know, it used to be, I mean, I'm in New Jersey. There used to be uh, the New York, the the New Jersey Nets, the, you know, there's still the New Jersey Devils, but, you know, the New Jersey uh, Nets be, now became the Brooklyn, uh, you know, Nets. Yeah, and they're on a tear right now. Apparently, a twelve-game streak. Yeah, well, you'll see what happens <laughs> at the end, but that's a different story. But you know, the the whole idea that so the idea I read about branding in New York, the name New York is the best brand in the world. You know, the the whole idea of that New York uh, name, and yet the Brooklyn uh, uh, Nets took on the name Brooklyn is a shocker. You know, is it and, though? I mean, they're literally in Brooklyn down by the Barclays Center. I'm 10 minutes away from my house. I mean, well, the Yankees are in the Bronx. Wow. That's true. They're not the Bronx. They're not the Bronx Yankees. They're the New York. But you know, when you have, I mean, at the time, was it Jay-Z that was invested in the nets? I mean, he's such a strong Brooklyn association and brand. I mean, you know, as you say, Brooklyn is a, is a brand. It's, well, it's, it's they, yeah, they probably wanted to separate themselves from the Knicks too. So, oh, that's... well, I think we all want to separate ourselves. From the Knicks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. Lately, the Nets have been a little in the news too much. But all right, well, we do have to do a podcast today, I guess. So, all right, let's uh, do that. yeah. So, I mean, we haven't kinda... even talked about my favorite team, the Warriors. But I, I could go on a tear about that. Oh, that's we're, only because they... ringer. <laughs> that's only because they're winning. You're, you're jumping uh, on no, the it's because I'm from the Bay Area. I and know, I know. Steph Curry is, you know, basically the mayor of California. So yeah, well, hopefully your husband's a Brooklyn uh, Nets fan, and then you can two can fight fight it out. No, there. no, no. He's actually a Bulls fan, so huh? that means that you know, in this season, he's actually become a, a Warriors fan because the Bulls are not doing well. Yeah, well, no more Michael Jordan a long time ago. So. Well, good. Let's let's get into our topic, money mindset and fundraising for nonprofits to thrive. Let's just start off with this whole world, the word, the words money mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, do, you know, we're doing we're a lot of our listeners are smaller nonprofits, you know, and what do you find when you are speaking to uh, the executive directors, maybe even sometimes the boards about not the boards, the executive directors, what are, what are they thinking about? The their what's their money mindsets typically like? Ugh, Stephen, you, you're just like round, round me up. I'm ready to go. So <laughs> I think the first and foremost, we have to think about the words that we use. So even the word nonprofit implies lack, right? It implies deficiency, and I think that mentality permeates throughout the sector, right? So when we think about nonprofits, when we think about nonprofit executive directors, generally, and I'm sure you see this in your work too, the first reaction, the first knee jerk thing is we can't afford that, you know, w- that is at, not outside of our budget, we can't afford it, you know, and it's interesting what you say about the about your sponsor, developing software for nonprofits, because as a sector, I think we're so used to getting the crumbs, right, we have to take what the for profit sector uses, and we have to configure it in such a way to make it work for us. Very rarely do we ever think that we are deserving of having software built for us or that we can afford the very best talent or that we can bring the resources that we need to do the really important work of changing the world. And so what I find is when I go into uh, nonprofits and I'm focused on fundraising, the first thing I see is really a deficit mindset around, well, you know, we can't afford that and we don't know any rich people and, you know, people aren't generous and we just can't get enough resources out there. And so I really believe that it all starts with your mindset because your mindset determines the feelings and your feelings determine the actions that you take. So let me give you an example. I always talk about this in a a dating context. So as I mentioned, I've, I'm married. It's been a really long time since I was single, but There were moments when I, in my dating life, when I would have dry periods, right? I couldn't catch a date to save my life. And then as soon as I was in a relationship, everybody wanted my number. And I was like, what's up with that? You know, where were you months ago? 
And what I realized is it's a vibe that you put out. Nobody is attracted to desperation. Desperation is a stinky perfume. And so many people in nonprofits approach fundraising from a desperate mindset of, oh my God, could you just please give us some money? You know, they make it feel like begging. They make it feel like, you know, they're on their knees. First of all, no one's attracted to that. But second of all, it devalues the work that you do in the world. Like if what you really do in the world is providing value is, you know, cleaning the oceans and saving whales and sending kids to college and housing people, that's really important and noble work. And I think we need to stand up and talk about it with pride and help attract people who also want to do the thing that we're doing. And I so I believe fundamentally we have to have a shift to number one, believe that there are enough resources out there because when we believe that there aren't enough resources, that's when we get into this scarcity, desperate survival mindset that creates lots of icky feelings, creates a lot of um, stress, frustration, anxiety. And then secondly, I think we also need to understand the value that we have in the world and how we exchange that value with people who want to support us. So I just said a mouthful. Let me pause there. Yeah, I, I, uh, my my hunch too that after all the nonprofit and and I'm I'm on the board of two nonprofits too so um and with all the people I deal with on a daily basis at, at financing solutions I have a lot of insight as to the mind of an executive director for a smaller nonprofit versus a larger nonprofit now a larger nonprofit would be like over ten million smaller nonprofits are like a million so mm-hmm. and what I've seen is successful nonprofits that really grow and really uh, provide an incredible service are the executive directors think first about raising money and second about the services that they provide and versus the other way around, which is a lot of executive directors come into nonprofits thinking about how they're going to help people and not thinking about how they're going to raise money. Mm -hmm. Um, and the successful nonprofits I see think of the reverse. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to unpack that a little bit. So a lot of times when you have executive directors, especially founders, and I find that founders are a unique species. Yes. Um, it, it, it's exactly right. They got into the business because they love, I, I call it hugging the panda bears, right? They wanted to hug the panda bears, save the panda bears. Um, and then, you know, maybe they've seen some success, they grow the organization. What a lot of nonprofit executive directors, particularly founders, fail to understand is that at a certain level, their job changes. Their job is no longer to hug the panda bears. Their job is to bring in resources to hire people to hug the panda bears. And I think that's really hard for founders because that that's not why they got into it in the first place. But I often say it's like being a university president, right? you were hired because maybe you were a good lecturer. But when you become the university president, your job is no longer to teach a class. Your job is no longer to grade papers. Your job is to bring resources in to the institution. And so I say that most EDs need to spend at least 65 to 80 percent of their time fundraising, um, yeah. which is a shocker for people. I'm like, what else? Like, what is your value if you're not doing that? The second thing is a lot of the reason why executive directors in particular, not all, but uh, a good number, don't want to do fundraising is that they uh, attribute fundraising to so many negative emotions, anxiety, stress, they feel like I'm begging. And that really goes to the mindset issue. So if we can shift the mindset and help people realize that it's just about attracting the right kind of supporters and creating a vision and helping people to step into the story of what we're trying to do. Then it just becomes a party, right? Then it's just, I'm having this party, who wants to come to it? And if you're going to come to my party, I'm going to tell you what to bring, but no one's ever been offended by being invited to a party. And so there's this disconnect between the ways that people feel when they give money to organizations that they love and their feeling about asking people to support organizations that they could potentially love. People love to give money to the things that they support, right? It feels good. It feels like I supported something, I I helped out, that's great. So why is it that we feel so bad about asking people to do the same for our nonprofits? It just makes no sense. So, um, and I think executive directors in particular that are reluctant to fundraise or imagine that hiring a development director will solve all their problems magically are living in la-la land. I mean, 
no, ain't no one going to do it but you. Yeah, you have the passion. The executive director has the passion. The other thing is, you know, if you the smaller nonprofits who are going to hire someone to do fundraising, uh, let's face it, you're going to probably get somebody who hasn't done it before and has to learn it on the job. And that's, that's, you know, that that's a big mistake when you're hiring somebody who hasn't done something before and you're asking them to do it. it the risk factor is very, very high. Um, yeah. you know, so go ahead. What so were you going to say? Oh, what I was going to say is when I first started my company a couple of years ago, I did some market research and every executive director I talked to their number one and number two problems were number one, fundraising, number two, staffing. And I can't tell you the number of people out here who are looking for a development director. The number of good development directors out there is limited. Uh, if you're really good, you're either already hired and being very well paid, or you know, you're not looking to move. And if you're not that good, you're, you're kind of getting recycled in the pool. So the issue is that we need to actually replenish the pool of really talented development directors. And so that's partially what I'm doing. I'm launching a group coaching program that starts in March with the idea being that most executive directors, A, don't really understand fundraising and so therefore can't train their development directors. Because to your point, for smaller nonprofits, you're not going to be able to afford the six-figure development director with lots of experience. But B, even if they do have the knowledge, don't have the time to properly train their people. So with this accelerator, what I'm trying to do is both train executive directors in the actual mechanisms of fundraising, but also I can train their team, which in the long run will save them tons of time and raise them money in a much shorter amount of time. Yeah, I, I started my career 30 years ago, or well, a little more than that, 35 years ago, working for Xerox, which those of you who don't know who Xerox was, they were the Google of its day. And they had an acronym there that they would use called LUDI, and it was learn, understand, teach, and inspect. So I think you can kind of use your, you know, that group that you're going to be doing the same way if, if you know, I think you definitely can hire someone who doesn't have experience in fundraising as long as you've done it yourself. And then mm -hmm. you can learn, understand, teach, and inspect. Um, you know, you do have to write, you do have to hire the right type of personality for that position, right? But, you know, well, use me as a case example because so I recently joined these two nonprofits and I always thought in my experience, uh, if, uh, in my past, that I would always be a good fundraiser. Mm -hmm. I'm extroverted. I'm, I, I've been in sales my whole life. You know, I, I, I love it. It's fun. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I joined these two nonprofits within the last uh, year and a half. Uh, um, uh, and I went out and, and started to fundraise. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and so my, my point of telling you that story was, you know, even I was a little bit reluctant and uh, a little uh, tentative. And it, 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 what I found personally was once I take, took that first step, that mm -hmm. first baby step, it, for, for me personally, it just, it was easy. Yeah. It was easy. I just took that first step. And then after I took that first step, um, then I took, another step. And I did, I did really well. I mean, I raised $35,000 for these two organizations and, uh, and you know, which was, I, I was the biggest, uh, uh, fundraiser uh, by far, you know, but, right, um, right. and, um, but my point being is that, you know, taking, uh, getting someone like you in there, the coach or to take a course with, that's a nice baby step. Well, I mean, I would even say it's more than a baby step. It's kind of a, a quantum leap forward because so yeah. often when I talk to nonprofits, you know, they'll say things like, well, you know, we haven't really met our goals or we don't, you know, our people aren't trained, et cetera, et cetera. And I say, okay, well, you know, why don't you enroll in this course? Oh, well, we can't afford it. So it's almost like, well, if nothing changes, then nothing changes, right? Like you have to invest in the change that you want, which again, it is that scarcity mindset of thinking about money at the door as an expense versus an investment in the future investment in capacity. But to your point, you know, the fact that you came out of sales obviously was a big step forward because I feel like 
you know, when it comes to board members who don't fundraise, it's usually a because of the money mindset, right? Like we all have a lot of anxiety about money and stories that we tell about money. B, we have a fear of rejection or a fear of judgment. Like, oh, what are my friends going to say or going to think about me if I ask them for money? And then C, a lack of training. So I don't know how much training you were offered, but I mean, the fact that you came out of sales, that you had this whole sort of toolkit. Most executive directors don't provide enough training for their board members and they say, okay, go out and fundraise. And if you've never fundraised or if you've never done sales, like what are you supposed to do? And here's the other thing that I think people misunderstand is that they think that the conversation is about money. It's not about the money. It's about the relationship. It's about the passion. And I think the failure that, you know, as a sector is we don't train our board members to understand that fundraising is not just about the solicitation. It's also about identifying potential prospects. It's about helping to cultivate that relationship and bringing them closer into the mission. It's about saying thank you, right? I think where we fall down as a sector is that we're not very good at stewardship. I think we have like a 45% retention rate across the industry. And so if all we ever did was just held onto the people who gave us money last year, we would be far ahead of the game. And, And board members can be involved in things like writing thank you notes, taking people out to lunch, making phone calls. That's fundraising too. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I could see where I'm like an executive director in that the causes I believe uh, that I was involved, that I am involved with are near and dear to my heart. Right. So for me to go ask people and, and the thing that's funny is that you know, maybe the the people I asked, they were so happy to give the money. In fact, in one case, they said that my ask was too small, right? And so, you know, the the, the two causes I was involved, I'm involved with is one where um, it's called Ween Dream, and we give uh, Halloween costumes to kids who cannot afford to get Halloween costumes. Oh, they are kids. that's so sweet. Yeah, and for those of you who think. Well, I know I'm talking to the the, uh, the tribe here, but you know the the, uh, the huge majority of the people, those kids are foster kids. Mm-hmm. So you would say, well, who can't afford you know a costume? They can't. Okay. Right. So um, so that's one, and then and I'll get to why this is important to me. The second one is an organization called Good Grief. They're actually larger; they're about ten million dollar organization. You know, Wean Dream is small; they're five hundred thousand. Um, Actually, the, yeah, they're, well, they actually didn't. It was all volunteer. So anyway, so Good Grief um, helps families that have lost um, um, a spouse um, mm. or a child. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I, my wife passed away a year and a half ago. And so. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So, and she was born on Halloween. And, oh. and uh, yeah. And Good Grief was um, really helped my, me and my, my son. I have a 13 year old and a 22 year old. And so these were two things um, that I, I, it was near and dear to my heart and I owed it to Gina. And I also o- felt like I, oh, that's my wife. And I mm. uh, felt I owed it to um, other families because good grief really helped me and my son so much. So mm. you know, I know mm-hmm. like with executive directors, they feel the same way about their cause. Yeah. You know, yeah. They, they really believe in it. So I, um, so, you know, listen, I, you said I, I had the sales experience, but keep in mind, this is like my 400th episode of the nonprofit MBA podcast. So I'm listening to people like you all the time. I, you right. know, can I point to one person who said, who helped me? No, but you know, the mindset of fundraising and listening to experts like yourself helped. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think to your point, well, first of all, I'm sorry to hear about your wife. And I think Thank it's you. wonderful that you've turned your your sorrow into something good. Um, You know, at the end of the day, it's not personal, right? And so, and I think that's hard because we pour so much of ourselves into the work, right? We have personal connections to why we do the things that we do, to the missions and so forth. But if somebody doesn't support you, it's not about you. You know, it's, I think, and I think the ways in which we take it so personally is why this, whole fundraising thing can feel like such a grind because we make it mean something about us. We make it mean like, well, people don't like me or they, you know, they think some kind of thing about me or they, you know, they hate whales or whatever it is. Um, But at the end of the day, 
your job is not to decide what other people do with their money. Your job is to merely invite them to participate in something that might be meaningful to them. And when we come from the space of abundance, which is this belief of like, hey, there are, are more than enough people out there who might be interested in the cause that that I'm, you know, that I'm interested in, um, then it becomes less of a desperation, right? It's a it's more about like, hey, it becomes a game to try to find those people who are my people, who are my tribe, as you say. Not everyone's gonna be in your tribe. And if they're not, it's not personal. Yeah, I uh it's tough. I would tell you, I mean, I I had one person who is was our best is our best friend, my my wife and I. And and he makes very good money and he donated a very small amount of money. And I was very, I, you know, I was like surprised and shocked. And I wouldn't, I'd tell you honestly that it affected me. And, but I agree with you in saying that, um, you know, my situation is a little different. It's very, it's incredibly personal, as personal it gets, right? But um, I, I don't think uh, you should, I don't think it's a great idea to be passionate about your cause I think you need to temper it down. And I, I think it's important that you really believe in your cause and you like it. Um, but I think, I don't know, it's easy to say, but this podcast is about mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And you can change your mindset. Yeah, that's exactly right. You can change your thoughts. You can choose to focus on the things that you choose to focus on, right? It's a decision that you make. And I think so often, especially when we're in fear, when we're in scarcity, when we're in kind of that desperate mode, we we pay attention to the things that go wrong. Like, I'll give you another example. Have you ever had a, a day where you've woken up and you've just been in a bad mood and then everything seems to go wrong? Like, you know, mm -hmm. you, you spill your coffee and your bus is late and blah, blah, blah. Like, everything goes wrong. It's because your energy is focused on the things going wrong not the things going right. And so similarly, when we're in this desperate state of like, I'm never gonna have enough, I'm never, never gonna be able to attract whatever, we're gonna pay attention to the things that validate our, our well, we call it confirmation bias, right? So I'm really focused on how do we use the brain to our advantage? And I'm not saying, you know, we shouldn't, uh, we should live in this world where we don't accept reality, then then we're just delusional. But I think we can look at circumstances and decide how are we going to react to them, right? If someone says that they don't want to support my cause, I can choose to either say like, okay, well, you know, A, maybe this is not their thing, or B, maybe, maybe I didn't do a good job of helping them understand and seeing the vision, or C, like, maybe they're just not a philanthropic person, right? Or D, oh my gosh, they're terrible people, and you know, they're not generous and they hate my cause, right? It's a choice. You get to decide <laughs> how you perceive and process the circumstance that happened. And I, I would say that the more you can reframe it for yourself, so you're not beating yourself up, the more successful you're going to be in the long term. And then last thing I want to say is I had a CFO once um, and I, uh, you know, I remember we didn't get a grant. It was like a pretty significant five figure grant. I got the letter, you know, sorry. And I'm like drooping around the office. He goes, what's wrong? And I was like, oh, we didn't get this grant. He goes, Rhea, let me, listen to me. Money should not be a deterrent of your mood, either an elevator or a depressor. It's just money. And I was like, what? <laughs> it's just money, right? It's just a piece of paper, but we ascribe so much meaning to it, especially in America. Uh, I think we and this idea, if you have money or if you make money, somehow you're a better, smarter person, right? It's just money. It's just a resource. And by the way, it's a renewable resource, unlike other resources. Like we don't have time that we can renew, air, water, but we can renew money. And so if we can just relax a little bit and let it flow, we can have such a different experience with fundraising and with money in general. Yeah. And talking about mindset too, I just like, you know, as I mentioned, I've, I have that sales mentality, but um, you, you, you got to have a lot of kindling wood in that fireplace. So if one yeah. doesn't catch, another one does. So in regards to the scenario that you mentioned with your CFO, you know, uh, the way I look at it and I say, well, I'm not going to, you know, listen, I better have a, a lot of different applications out there for grants. I mean, yeah. you know, because there's going to be a hit ratio and, you know, and 
you know, in early on, maybe it's one out of 10, uh, maybe it gets to be, you know, three out of 10 as we continue to, to get better at grant writing. But, you know, I'm using that as an example as one fundraising. Uh, and so that's one thing. And it, the other thing is like something I was going to say too, go, going back, you know, it's, it is true about the mindset. Like I look at, I, I speak to a lot of nonprofit consultants who help organizations raise money like yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I'm, I am amazed because I sit there and I say, I would hire you guys if I was running a nonprofit in a second, Mm -hmm. because you're going to pay for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to pay for yourself. You know, what's what's crazy, Stephen is I, so I talked to a lot of people who are interested in my program. I actually have a money back guarantee, which is if you use my strategies, you know, good faith effort, and you haven't made up the cost of tuition in six months in new or increased donations, I refund your money. Like, yeah. This is a, you literally cannot lose money on this. And you know, you'd be surprised at how many people say no. Cause I'm like, this is a completely risk-free proposition. And I think, again, it goes back to the scarcity mindset of nonprofits, which is that we are so reluctant to spend money because we're so locked in this idea of like, there's never going to be enough. And I have to like hold tightly to every single penny I have, even if there's an opportunity for me to make more money by this investment, which, you know, it, it, I have this analogy. It's like, you know, you're, uh, let's say you're on a bicycle pedaling somewhere and I roll up to you in a car and I say, Hey, Steve, you know, if you jump into this car, I can teach you how to drive a car and you'll get to your destination way faster. And you say, no, 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 I can't, I'm too busy pedaling. And you're like, okay. I, I, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Um, wait, but can I go back to the thing that you said about your friend? I don't, I don't want to break him over the coals here, but did you ask him for a specific amount? No. So I think Stephen, that might be where, and when you asked, was it an email ask or was it a person to person ask? Email. Okay. So that this is where you aired. What I would say if, if we were to workshop this is I think you have to go to your friend personally. You have to have a sit down conversation and I'll give your listeners just a little tidbit. It's two sentences, one question. So the first sentence is a you sentence like, you know, Bob, I'm making up his name, you know, as you know, I, I lost Gina and this was a really tough time for me. You know, the second sentence is him sentence, Bob, you've been such a good friend to me and to Gina throughout this really hard time. And you know, this organization really helped us. And then the last is a question. And the question has to be specific with an ask amount, a date, and what it's going to do. Bob, would you be willing to consider a $10,000 gift by July 31st so that we could expand our programming? Yeah. And then you stop talking. Yeah, it's right? great advice. It is. It's interesting because the the other one, uh, the Good Grief Organization, I only went to people that I knew had a lot of money and I asked the specific amount. Mm-hmm. And all of them gave the money and all and and that's the one that people said I asked for too little. Mm-hmm. And so why you didn't know? you ask your friend, your friend for a specific amount? Um, it was the first time I had done it. I also, it was, I was going to people maybe who, like, I was going to a very broad audience. Um, yep. And, 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 um, I didn't know to do it. Um, I, you know, I, uh, I also, uh, thought, um, you know, some of the people, you know, they all can certainly afford it. We're talking about small money there, you know, but, you know, we're talking about 50, a hundred dollars, you know, I mean, we're talking about small amount of money. The other one was different. Okay. I mean, Look, I don't know your friend. It could just be that he's not a philanthropic person, but you know, it's like it's like going into a restaurant and if there are no prices on the menu, yeah. how am I supposed to know how much to pay for a burger? Right. It's almost yep. like I go to a restaurant and I am like, okay, how much is this burger? And you say, Well, how much do you want to pay? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to know about a burger? Yeah. Right. As opposed to I go to the restaurant, I see the prices listed and I say, okay, I'm going to get the burger for 20 bucks or whatever it is. Yeah. So I, you know, again, to go back to your point about your friend, like you're, you're making it mean that he doesn't care about this really important thing to you. It could just be that he didn't know what was an appropriate amount or what you were expecting. Yeah, I I agree with you. And I, it's, um, I, I would just tell you, it's more of a curiosity thing for me than, than anything else too. You know, listen, I'm a practicing Buddhist. And I, I, 
you know, I, I, what I know is that I find, I don't want to hurt myself in this either. <laughs> okay. In yeah. other words is uh, I'm grieving and I, if I'm not going to spend a lot of time on thinking about his donation in relation to the friendship, um, because I'm the one who pays the price, not him. Right. Right. right, right so, right. so it's just, for me, it's a curiosity thing. And I agree with you, you know, like looking at this now and saying, okay, well for next year, I, I have a list of all the people cause I sent thank you notes out to everybody. Mm -hmm. And now next year, I know, I mean, I know what he gave and now I'm going to be very, and not him, everybody. I know what everybody gave and I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask them for more money if I don't think it was appropriate in essence. You know, if some person gave me quite a bit, then that's maybe a different story. So the other thing I would say, Stephen, is you increase the likelihood of success by 70% if you do an in-person ask. Yeah, I, I, I get it. I get it. Um, uh, let me think about it. Yeah. I think about it. I mean, I got a still, it's it, the only my hesitation is, um, is time. That's my hesitation. I'm still raising a 13 year old. Like I'm running a business, you know, for me to go see everybody, he lives in two hours and a half hours away. Some people live far, you know, I guess yeah, you, I could always do it. True. But you know what? That's why we also have zoom. Yeah. Yeah. No, cool. I appreciate the advice and it's good. It's good. Like, here we go. We're talking about changing my mindset which is what mm -hmm. this podcast is. And that's why I think the value is, I think you need somebody in the outside to, you know, ask those questions that you asked because I'm in my mind. I yeah. can't help my mind, you know, unless I have well, another person questioning me. So, yeah, well, it's interesting that you're a practicing Buddhist because I think a lot of what I espouse as far as money mindset is about, you know, some of it is rooted in Buddhist practice around like the monkey mind, right? So we know the monkey mind is just constantly jumping around and making yep. meaning and creating stories. And it's like, okay, can we just calm ourselves down a little bit, calm our mind down a little bit and see what's really here and, and uh, respond instead of react? Because I think, you know, the, the heart of Buddhism is really about, you know, compassion and reflection and uh, patience Kindness. and not and like not responding to this like reactive moment. And, uh, and I think if we can just give ourselves that little space between stimulus and reaction that we can take a breath and be like, huh, what's this about really? Like, you know, Tara Brock is one of my favorite people to listen yeah. to. And um, she talks about, you know, rain and really, you know, inquiring what, it, what what's this all about? Um, and so I think if we can pause ourselves enough to ask, like, what's this really about? Is this really about this donor? Or is this really about, you know, my upbringing and my parents who told me that I would never have enough money? <laughs> then I can actually kind of sort out the feelings that I have. Like, okay, well, let me acknowledge that what this is really about is, is more about me than it is about this other person and what they did or didn't do. Yeah, I mean, we could go a whole eight hour podcast about Buddhism and its approach. And I know Tara, uh, I've read her, that, uh, that book rain. So, um, well, I watched mm -hmm. her video rain on, on rain. Um, it is extremely helpful and, you know, meditation is such an important part of being able to affect your ability to act proactively versus well, that's not the right word versus reactively. Yeah. Um, it slows things down for you and uh, it's very, very helpful. So, yeah. Um, so I know we have to get, wrap up. Can I, can I just share one more thing? Please. So one of the things that I talk about in my training and I got this from, uh, actually my coach, Dr. Eugene Choi, who is into neuroscience, that the brain is ever only in one of two modes, either survival or executive mode. Survival mode is when our amygdala is going crazy. It's when we get into fight, fight, or freeze. Um, it's when we get irritable. That's when we freak out when like the coffee is cold and we miss our bus or whatever it is. Executive happens in the prefrontal cortex when we're able to make good decisions, we're able to reflect, we're able to be creative and generous, and we're in flow state. How often on average do you think most people are in their survival state? 90% of the time. <laughs> It's yeah. a little bit less, it's about 70% of the time, but that's okay. exactly right. Most of yeah. us are just freaking out all of the time. And so we're not able to respond to the world in 
a way that's sort of calm and reflective and, and you know, accessing our executive functioning. We're just responding like we're under attack all of the time. And I, I think the pandemic certainly did not help our general levels of anxiety. But I, so, you know, what I really teach my students is about, first of all, becoming aware of your mental and emotional state and then what to do about it. Yeah, I would also probably add the higher amount of times that you are in your executive state, the happier you will be. Oh, there's 100%. Probably, yeah, there's definitely a correlation. Um, I mean, it's got the, you know, so, you know, I think uh, let's, you know, if we bring it back to this whole podcast about mindset and taking a step back and understanding why you don't like fundraising, what it, you know, what it is, what is it, you know, getting into your executive uh, mind. Uh, so let's, let's pick a better uh, terminology in an executive, just to be able to analyze step back. Cause we're all running that the, the, we're all running a million miles an hour. Right. Mm-hmm. And the value of meditating or taking a step back. Most people think there's two types of meditating and this will be helpful for everybody. You know, there's meditating where you're, and I'll use my words, you're clearing your mind. You're mm-hmm. trying to clear your mind. By the way, you'll never do it, but it's the practice of trying to clear your mm-hmm. mind. And then there's another one, and it's called contemplative meditation. I, I, that's the funnest part of meditation. For me, it's the easier mm-hmm. part, right? Mm-hmm. Contemplating is when you are trying to really kind of work on one thing. Mm-hmm. And, you're, mm-hmm. and you're kind of working on that. So one of your contemplative meditation, or when you go for a walk, even, you know, go for a walk, don't have any music and just think, what is it about fundraising that I just don't like to do? What is it? You know, why? Yeah. Well, so I actually, I have some tips here. So oftentimes we, uh, let me back up. So memories are created when there's a strong memory associated with it, either positive or negative. That's how the hippocampus works, right? And so in my training, I ask people to reflect on, well, what are the things that I heard growing up, right? So in my family, I always heard, well, money doesn't grow on trees. And who do you think we are? The Rockefellers. What did you see growing up? What did your parents or caretakers model for you? What strong emotions do you have about money? So you know, growing up, I remember some of the biggest fights I ever saw my parents get into was about money, right? And so, of course, I had this negative association with money. What are the ways in which I treat my own money today that is rooted in my past? And how do the feelings I have about money from my upbringing affect fundraising today? And what you'll find is that a lot of people have very negative feelings about money of not having enough, not ever, you know, being enough, having enough, doing enough. And, you know, what I would say, so we're getting deep into this, is um, a lot of us are taught about money from our parents and their parents aren't from their parents. So their parents came up through the depression, let's say. So we are passing down depression era money mindsets in 2023, which aren't necessarily serving us anymore, right? So we have to upgrade the technology, up, you know, update the software. And yet, because we haven't questioned, is this really true? That is this actually working for me? We just continue to run the old code. Yeah, I think it's going back to the idea of analyzing, you know, or thinking about why you feel you want to uh, do what you do. So, um, no, listen, it's all good stuff. And uh, I really like today's podcast. I think mindset is the first place to start. Don't start on implementing something work on the mindset first, which was a lot of what we talked today. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank so much um, Raya uh, uh, Wong from Raya Wong Consulting for coming on today's podcast. And if you like today's podcast, please feel free to share it with a friend and also subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. If you like today's podcast, please also give us a review on your podcasting app, it really helps get the word out about the nonprofit MBA podcast. And of course, if you're looking for a line of credit for your nonprofit, you can call us at 862-207-4118 or visit our website at nonprofitmbapodcast.com. Raya, um, if people want to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? 
Yeah, uh, my website is the best place to do it, riawong.com, R-H-E-A-W-O-N-G, or you can also find me on LinkedIn. And I also have a podcast as well, Nonprofit Lowdown, that folks should definitely listen to. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you. So much fun. So, uh, you know, I do this at, at the end of every podcast and it's, it's always, I always, it's very heartfelt. Um, I want to thank everybody out there for making the world a better place. Um, I know Raya and I are trying to do our best, but you guys are out there doing the heavy lifting and I thank you for that. Uh, we certainly need you. And, uh, I just want to remind you, especially in the new year that you are not a good, any good to your family, your friends your employees, uh, anybody, if you don't take good care of yourself first. So you need to think about that every single day. Think about first, what do I need to do today to make sure that I am the best I can be? Rather that be physical fitness, taking a break, you know, laughing, you know, take care of yourself first. There's a mindset for you. And then the, the rest will come much easier to you. So everybody, have a fantastic day. Again, I want to wish everybody a happy new year, healthy and happy.